It was once said that she had only two ambitions in life, to make it in Hollywood and marry a military husband. Sadly, she would achieve neither. On a brisk Los Angeles morning in 1947, Mrs. John Bersinger exited her home in a then sparsely populated neighborhood located just north of Coliseum Drive on South Norton Avenue. With her three-year-old daughter, Anne, close at her side, they began heading south along the sidewalk towards Lemert Park, a lover's lane graveyard of overgrown weeds and empty vacant lots. As they continued along, the little girl began to point in the direction of what appeared to be the broken remains of a department store mannequin laying in two distinct halves a few inches off of the sidewalk. It was not a store mannequin. Police soon blanketed the area in what became a frenzied but fruitless search for clues. Estimated to have been placed there sometime before dawn, the body was that of a young girl, thought to be around 17 years of age, with recently dyed hair, its reddish-brown tint giving way to its original color of black, visible at the roots and just beginning to grow back out. The victim had been severed in two with an almost surgical-like precision. No blood was visible, either on or around the body, indicating the killing had taken place elsewhere. Both halves had been meticulously scrubbed clean with bristles from the brush found still embedded in her flesh. Rope and wire burns covered the wrists, ankles, neck, and upper right thigh, indicating the victim had been trussed up and tortured prior to death. A deep gash on the victim's upper left thigh would later reveal that the killer had seemingly taken it upon himself to remove a rose tattoo in an apparent attempt to mask her identity. Dubbed by the press as victim of the werewolf killer, identification would reveal the body to be that of Elizabeth Short, age 22, a resident of Medford, Massachusetts. One of five daughters, Elizabeth was born on July 29, 1924, to parents Cleo and Phoebe Short, in Hyde Park, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston. Sometime afterwards, the family relocated to nearby Medford, situated only minutes north from downtown Boston City. Its small-town atmosphere seemed the perfect setting in which to raise five children. On October 15, 1930, Cleo Short disappeared. Foul play was suspected after police located Cleo's car, abandoned in a nearby parking lot. Phoebe Short placed an immediate appeal on the local newspaper asking for help in locating her missing husband. It was to no avail. Phoebe and her five daughters moved from their Evans Street home into this house on McGowan Avenue. The girls spent grades one through six at Swan Elementary School, ideally situated only blocked from their new home. Swan had been built to serve as an elementary school in the late 1800s, but changed into a junior high school in 1916. It remained a junior high until 1927, when, with the opening of Roberts, it reverted back to an elementary school. By the time Elizabeth entered Roberts Junior High School, she was already plagued with a history of medical problems that included acute asthma and childhood tuberculosis, with respiratory problems eventually resulting in an empyema operation to drain her right lung. Her seventh grade school record indicates an unusually low attendance, whereby she missed a total of 53 unexplained school days. 
by her eighth grade year, she had bounced back, with above average marks in most of her subjects. In school, Elizabeth was a very hard worker, but she had to struggle to keep even a C average. Classmates recall that she was an exceptionally attractive girl, well-liked, and extremely nice to everyone. Elizabeth graduated Roberts and entered Medford High School in September 1939. It was also the month World War II began, and almost overnight, it seemed every other guy in America was wearing a uniform, and every other gal in America wanted one of those guys, including Elizabeth Short. By high school, Elizabeth had blossomed into one of the most beautiful girls in Medford, and students were calling her the Deanna Durbin of Medford High School. A schoolgirl's memento book recovered by police attested to the fact by noting the similarity between the two in no less than ten different inscriptions. Elizabeth's focus in high school seemed somewhat lacking in respect to her previous grades at Roberts. The courses she took indicated a business interest, but by the end of her sophomore year, Elizabeth had dropped out of high school completely. The school itself managed to survive for another 25 years until fire finally forced its closure in 1965. Refurbished, the building today serves as an apartment complex. Elizabeth managed to stay around Medford for about a year after dropping out of high school before she finally ended up in Miami Beach, Florida, working as a waitress. Phoebe Short, Elizabeth's mother, later told reporters that her daughter had decided on a warmer climate due to her serious asthma condition. Elizabeth met Major Matt Gordon Jr. at a local Miami night spot. The two hit it off immediately, and for a time, it looked as though she had found her military husband. Gordon, a Flying Tigers pilot in the Air Corps, was stationed in Miami, but was then shipped overseas. Elizabeth kept in constant contact by writing to him, at one time sending him some 27 letters in a span of only 11 days. On January 30, 1943, Elizabeth applied for work at Camp Cook, a military PX near Santa Barbara, California, and was hired. Described by her former manager as one of the loveliest girls that she had ever seen, Elizabeth eventually earned the honor of Cutie of the Week. She told the manager that she needed the job desperately and had come out to California for health reasons. During her stay there, she kept pretty much to herself, though she was thought to be friendly with one particular soldier, a jealous Marine whom she was also rumored to be afraid of. She departed the base in early 1943 after only a brief stay. Closed after World War II, Camp Cook was reactivated briefly for use in the Korean War. It closed for good in 1953 and is now Vandenberg Air Force Base. After leaving Camp Cook, Elizabeth was somehow able to locate her missing father, Cleo Short, now living in Viejo, California. She contacted him by letter asking for money. Thinking that was all she was after, he sent her some, only to have her use it to come visit him. Although not thrilled by her presence, he agreed to let her stay there, provided she kept the house straight and followed his rules. Of course, she did neither, and shortly thereafter he kicked her out completely, saying that she never stayed home and always came in late. In September 1943, Elizabeth had taken up residence in Santa Barbara, not far from her old job at Camp Cook. She was now living in a small apartment on West Montecito Street and hanging out with soldiers almost every night. On September 23rd, she was taken into custody for being in a restaurant with intoxicated servicemen. Although Elizabeth herself was not drinking, she had told conflicting stories about her age which was the primary reason that she was taken in. After a probation department hearing, she was given a ticket east and instructed to leave Santa Barbara and return to her home in Medford. By April 1945, Major Matt Gordon, Jr., still stationed overseas, finally gave in to Elizabeth's obsessive letter writing and proposed marriage. Elizabeth accepted, but before he could return home, his plane crashed in India, and he was killed. 
Elizabeth continued her incessant pattern of wandering and finally returned to Medford in February 1946 for what would be her final visit home. During her stay, she was said to have worked as a cashier in one of the two local movie theaters located in familiar Medford Square. On April 17th, Elizabeth headed back to the West Coast, this time moving to Hollywood. Her early days there were filled with destitution, hunger, and poverty, living in a small hotel room on North Orange Drive. By the time summer arrived, Elizabeth had moved south to Long Beach. From mid-July until August 3rd, Elizabeth resided at the Washington Hotel in Long Beach, California. The hotel was located on Linden Avenue, a short distance from the local drugstore hangout, where she was said to have received her now infamous title. She frequented the store, usually clad in black, and often in the company of a serviceman. A group of local admirers began to jokingly refer to her as the Black Dahlia, black from her attire and Dahlia for her beauty. It was also rumored that the Dahlia reference came from the way in which she sometimes wore her hair. However, it is more than likely that the actual term itself was a play in the film titled The Blue Dahlia. It was also during this period in Long Beach that Elizabeth reportedly spent time in the local lesbian community, thus giving rise to the speculatory rumors that she had been slain by a jealous female rival. Captain Jack Donahoe, head of the Dahlia team, reasoned that the wounds inflicted on Short's body were similar in respect to those which had previously been performed by women in other cases. Elizabeth, having checked her suitcases at a Los Angeles bus station on January the 9th, would have been completely without clothes or makeup and may have planned on borrowing those items from a female source. Later, though never completely confirmed, a girl matching Short's description was spotted by a barman at the Four Star Grill on Hollywood Boulevard only three days before the murder. The girl, whom the bartender swore was Elizabeth Short, was seated in the company of two other women and described as cowardly withdrawn, possibly drugged, and wearing a crumpled black dress with torn nylon stockings. A week had gone by following the murder, and police still had no leads to go on, until an editor at one of the local newspapers received a phone call from a person claiming responsibility in the killing. In a male voice that could only be described as soft and silky, the mysterious caller recounted details about the mutilation of the body that no person, aside from the killer himself, could have possibly known. The caller was also described as egotistical and proud of the fact that he had, so far, eluded police, adding that he would be sending some of her souvenirs along soon. Within days, a patchwork-lettered envelope, reeking strongly of gasoline, would be plucked from the U.S. postal system and turned over to homicide detectives. The package contained the entire contents of Elizabeth Short's still-missing purse and was theorized that whoever had sent the package had anticipated burning its contents but had changed their mind. The package was literally covered in fingerprints. However, the gasoline had dissolved their oily substance, thus making latent identification impossible. The package also contained what police considered their best lead yet, Elizabeth Short's personal address book. Although it has often been described as her little black trick book, fueled primarily by the sole fact it contained 75 names and numbers, the book, in reality, was not even hers to begin with. On the book's brown leather cover was the name Mark M. Hansen and the year 1937. Hansen, described as a local theatrical manager in Hollywood, lived at 6024 Carlos Avenue and used to rent out rooms in his home to young and aspiring actress types. The address book given to him as a gift by his friends from his homeland of Denmark had been in his possession for nine years by the time Elizabeth had come to stay there in August of 1946. The book contained a multitude of Hollywood names, including some relatively well-known studio notables. Elizabeth, ever on the outlook for ways in which to get her foot in the door, took the address book with her when she left. The story was later verified by Anne Toth, 
a bit player and friend of Elizabeth's who lived at the residence with her. This parking lot now occupies the home's original site. It was in this mortuary that the halves of Elizabeth Short, so heinously separated only one week before, were placed back together and embalmed for final burial. Shipped out on January 21st, the casket was taken to nearby Union Station and placed on a train bound for Oakland. For a girl who had been almost constantly on the move, it was sadly to be her last trip anywhere. The next day, a 45-minute inquest was held detailing what the coroner had determined to be her main cause of death. Cleo Short, Elizabeth's estranged father, refused to attend, saying he hadn't seen Elizabeth since 1943 and did not wish to be involved in any way with his former family. Cause of death was found to be from two separate sources. Concussion of the brain due to several sharp blows sustained from a blunt instrument, and from shock and hemorrhage due to a facial laceration in which the killer had carved into her features a sardonic ear-to-ear -ear grin. Within the same week, police had also located what was purported to be Elizabeth's missing purse and one black shoe found lying in a trash can in front of this address only two miles north of the vacant lot where her body had been discovered. But by the time police got there, the can had been emptied and taken to the local dump site. The witness, however, had no trouble in picking out the items, the purse from its lingering scent and the shoe from its double heel cap put on for her specially before she left San Diego. If this is true, then the killer would have been traveling north, away from the vacant lot, and probably back towards the scene of where the murder had actually taken place. The Crenshaw address where the items were first spotted was by coincidence located only less than a mile from Cleo Short's current residence at this address on South Kingsley Drive and Olympic Boulevard. Elizabeth moved into this building on Cherokee Avenue on November 11, 1946, and remained here until December the 5th. She roomed with seven other girls on the top floor of the building in apartment number 501. Endowed with an almost childlike innocence, Elizabeth seemed like a fish out of water when it came to handling men. Known to have a different date every night, she had developed a reputation as a kind of tease among men, who perhaps wanted more than what she was willing to give them. What she did seem to want, however, was to settle down and one day raise a family. But given her fickle nature and incessive wandering pattern, it was safe to assume that day would be a long time in coming. Elizabeth left Hollywood December 5th, telling friends that she would be traveling north for Christmas to visit her sister in Berkeley. Instead, she headed south to San Diego. By the time she arrived in San Diego, she was once again destitute and penniless. Befriended by a young theater usherette named Dorothy French, Elizabeth was eventually invited to stay with Dorothy and her mother in their home located in Pacific Beach's Bayview Terrace Housing Project on Camino Pradero Drive. During her stay there, Elizabeth seemed reluctant to discuss her past, saying only that she had formerly been employed as a hat model and was the widowed war bride of Major Matt Gordon, Jr., an exaggerated claim that no one was ever actually able to verify. A frequent customer at this diner, located across the street from the housing projects, Elizabeth appeared moody and irritable at times over what was thought to be her failure to find work. However, some of her closer friends felt that she had something specific on her mind, something that was bothering her deeply that she would not or could not confess. The circus of sensationalism that followed the case prompted an array of confessions from people all over the country, claiming responsibility in the slaying. All were eventually released, including the only prime suspect in the case, Robert Red Manley. Manley was the last known person to see Elizabeth Short alive, after dropping her off at L.A.'s luxurious Biltmore Hotel on January 9th. He claimed to have first met Short during a business trip in San Diego about one week before Christmas. 
Nicknamed Red because of his hair color, Manley was discharged from the service in April of 1945 on what was thought to have been psychological grounds. By the time he ran into Elizabeth Short, he and his attractive wife Harriet had been married a little over a year and were presently going through what was described by Manley as an adjustment period over the recent birth of their new son. Manley picked up Elizabeth at the French's home on January 8th. Due to business reasons, Manley told her he would not be able to leave until the following morning. They then spent the evening dining, dancing, and drinking. When it came time to find a motel for the night, Manley suggested they share a room for convenience purposes only. Although the two also shared kisses, Manley strongly denied making love to her. Elizabeth, who rarely drank liquor, had done so that evening, and by the time they got to their room, she was deathly sick. Manley claimed that he went straight to bed. Elizabeth, however, sat up most of the night suffering from chills. The next morning, after making a few phone calls, Manley returned to the motel to pick up Elizabeth, who seemed to be feeling much better. They left San Diego at 12.20 p.m. and headed for Los Angeles. By late afternoon, Manley had already dropped Elizabeth by a downtown bus station where she had checked her two suitcases. Then they proceeded on to the Biltmore Hotel a few blocks away. Once there, Elizabeth asked Manley to check at the front desk to see if her sister had arrived yet. Elizabeth reportedly told Manley that her sister Virginia was a short, blonde-haired woman but in reality, her sister's hair was dark. Manley waited with her in the lobby until 6.30 p.m. Manley swore that was the last time he ever saw Elizabeth Short. Elizabeth waited around the hotel lobby for the next several hours, sometimes asking for messages at the front desk. It was around 10 p.m. when she finally exited the hotel alone and began walking south down Olive Street. Clad almost entirely in black dress, she blended off into the shadows and vanished in the darkness. Robert Manley was immediately taken into custody as the number one prime suspect in the case. Arrested at the home of his friend Harry Palmer in the Los Angeles suburb of Eagle Rock, Manley's car was found parked in Palmer's garage and impounded as evidence. No trace of Elizabeth's blood was found and after days of repetitive questioning, grueling interrogation, and several lie detector tests, Manley was finally exonerated of all charges and released. Seven years later, Robert Manley was committed to an insane asylum by his faithful wife Harriet. She had found him writing cryptic notes, hearing strange noises, and suffering from a guilt complex. Though detectives once again questioned him about the crime, they once again went away convinced of his innocence. In the days following the murder, reports began to surface from people all over the city and beyond, claiming to have seen Elizabeth during her so-called missing week. Sighted at this former lounge, once known as the dugout, she was said to have been spotted here on January 11th, seated in the company of a bossy blonde-haired woman. On January 12th, she was seen also at this market on South Hoover Street near the airport. The clerk said he'd changed a quarter for her so she could use the payphone, adding that the girl matched Elizabeth to a T. January 13th, she was supposedly seen seated in her favorite but now empty chair in the San Diego diner that she once frequented. Noon, January 14th, only 12 hours before the murder. She was said to be standing at these ticket windows at Union Train Station in downtown Los Angeles, asking for information about having her baggage forwarded to Ketchikan, Alaska. When the clerk asked the name of the party for whom the bags would be going to, the girl reportedly replied, Elizabeth Short. That evening, a girl approached a local policewoman pleading hysterically for protection from her jealous military boyfriend who had just threatened to kill her. The policewoman took the girl, whom she described as matching Elizabeth's description, back to the bar from where she had run and left her there. 
none of these sightings were ever positively confirmed. What is known for sure is that she would have been in the city as of January 9th and without luggage of any kind, with odds placed most favorably on the theory that she met up with her killer that evening sometime after leaving the Biltmore Hotel. The vacant lots that once populated the area along South Norton Avenue have today given way to a quiet residential neighborhood. Only this fire plug remains to mark the spot where the body of a beautiful girl once laid and is in itself the only but silent witness to her killer's true identity.